Good morning. Nice to be with you. It's cool up here. Wow, what a change from uh, from uh, yesterday. I kind of like that hot weather. I'm with Bruno. Let's package it and save it. Very mid mention of uh, of the church start happening here in a few months, and in, and so I guess in uh, it, it kind of feels uh, somewhat unique knowing that this might be the last time I'll preach up here, certainly as a preaching team member. But I certainly want to say that I've, I've just enjoyed it so much over the years. And, and uh, you'll see me. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to disappear off the planet. And one of my workers said, one of my employees said, they'll preach in such a way that everybody's happy to see you go. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, you know what? The, the reality is, and this is my heart, is uh, the new church is called Hope Church. And, and uh, if, if the BEMC does well... We're happy. If we do well, you're happy because we're part of the same body. I want to make that abundantly clear. That is the reality of it all. It's about the kingdom of God coming with intensity both to this church and any other church that's out there that preaches the cross, that preaches Jesus Christ. And some are more comfortable maybe in one church setting than another setting. That's fine. But I can tell you this, that in Revelation 7, when we're all standing shoulder to shoulder, waving palm branches before Christ the King, saying salvation belongs to your God who sits on the throne, there will be, it'll be absolute, unadulterated fellowship, and it'll be beautiful. Let's gun for it right now and right here, and I think it will happen, and it's beautiful. But let's pray anyhow. Father God, thank you for the reality of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the reality of the fellowship that we have through the power of of the Holy Spirit. It is because of our love for Jesus. And we want to talk about following Jesus here this morning. And um, I just want to become uh, more of a disciple the older I get. And learn what it all means. And so I pray, Father God, I, I pray especially even for the younger ones here this morning. My desire is that they catch it. The 10-year-olds, the 12-year-olds, the 13-year-olds, the 85-year-olds, Father God, that we catch your call, your beckon, your, des your desire for us to follow you. You're the leader, we follow you. I pray that that reality would become powerful after I am done, not because of me. I must decrease, you must increase. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We're, we're in a series uh, of Anabaptist distinctives. And, um, and I'm not going to get into that in a big way. Barry did a beautiful job a few weeks ago regarding that. And, uh, and I will say from the outset that I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't call myself a full-blooded Anabaptist in, sense of, in the sense of embracing everything that they taught. We see through a glass dimly. So did they, so do we. And yet I can tell you this, that what I've been asked to speak on this morning, which is discipleship, which I believe, and I'm not the only one, which I believe is maybe, maybe one of the most powerful, significant Anabaptist distinctives. And I'll, I'll just give me a few minutes what I mean by that. And it's one that I'm completely on side with, and it's one that I embrace, it's one that I love, because it's biblical, not because Menno Simon started, or Blaudock, or Mons, or Dank, or Phillips, or Pilgrim Marpack. These guys, they all believed in it, but they believed in it because they saw it in Scripture. And that's why I believe in it as well. I want to make that abundantly clear this morning. I want to say this, is that the Anabaptists were not part of the Reformation. What do I mean? 500 years ago, we had a reformation. What does reformation mean? It means that something has to be reformed. Years ago, we had a political party called the Reform Party. They wanted to reform the political landscape of Canada. So 500 years ago, when we had a reformation, people wanted to reform the way church was done, the way the scriptures were even understood. And I want to say this, is the Anabaptists were not necessarily reformers. They were re-institutionalists. What do I mean by that? They thought that the church was beyond reformation, and so they believed, let's just reinstitute New, Test New Testament apostolic Christianity. So the Reformation didn't go far enough. The church is beyond Reformation. Let's reinstitute reality. And frankly, I think they had a point. And I believe we've all benefited from the Re Reformation. No question about that. But I personally, we've also benefited from the teachings of many of our forefathers. And, uh, and I, I want to say this too, is that, that uh, one of the things, every movement has its own weakness. And that's why we've got to keep looking to Jesus Christ. The Reformation, and I, I, by the way, if I'm using words, I want to be simple. I don't want to be simplistic. I want to be simple. 
I want people to understand what I'm saying here this morning. But the Reformation gave rise to a beautiful teaching. In other words, there's nothing I can do to merit salvation. It's all a free gift from Christ. It's free. And so it's positional salvation. I was not saved. Now I am saved because, because of the grace of Christ. It's unmerited favor. That sounds Christianese, doesn't it? It's free. It's nothing I did. Now, the weakness of that teaching came, up, uh, it came simply called no lordship salvation. It doesn't matter how I live. Now, please understand, I don't believe that that always gave birth to this. But there's a weakness in it. It doesn't matter how I live. I'm saved. I asked a, a worker of mine years ago, no, a guy that I worked beside years ago. I said, John, are you born again? He said, it all depends if you believe in once saved always saved. In other words, what he was saying is my life does not reflect the teachings of Scripture, but if that teaching is true, then I guess I'm saved. Now, the Anabaptists came along and they said, hang on a second. If your life does not reflect a newness, it does not reflect an emulation of Jesus Christ, if you're not living out the teachings of Jesus Christ, you are simply not saved. And they were stringent on that. Now, I, I love their teachings, and I love the fact that they corrected what has become, I believe, an, an easy, greasy grace, no lordship, salvation, a weakness. But the weakness within Anabaptist teaching was simply, i got to work my way into this grace. i got to work. Have I worked enough? Well, am I saved tonight? Or do I need to accept Christ into my heart again? Have I been good today? And so there's weaknesses, but there's also strengths to both movements, to both teachings. And, uh, and um, I've already said far more than I was going to on that whole thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote the, uh, the discipleship, what's, what's it called? The, the cost of discipleship. And he said repeatedly in that book, to believe is to obey, and to obey is to believe. And that, in essence, is what I want to talk about here this morning. I'll keep an eye on the time. I've got two pages of notes. Usually I come up with one page. Today I've got two, and so get comfortable. We might be here for a while. But I w I'll, be, I'll be sensitive to the time. Now, Years ago when I was in Sunday school, and that was many years ago, we sang some songs in Sunday school. I have decided to follow Jesus, and no turning back the cross before me, the world behind me. What, what, other, what was another course? Um, Though none go with me, still I will. Anybody ever sing that in Sunday school? Is that old? You guys still sing that? Or how about they... they Left all and followed Jesus. Who was they talking about? Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. I want to talk about the fact that those courses, as trite as they were and as cute as they were, they are reality. I want to say to you that when it says they left all to follow Jesus is the same call that has been given to us. And so crack your Bibles open, if you would, please, to Luke 14. And we want to talk about some things, and I want to basically cover four things, maybe five things, but let's go with four for now, and then we'll conclude with a few other things. I certainly want to say some things before I'm off this stage, and so if I don't get to all four of these, I'll give them to you right now. The bulletin has a bit of a spot where you can take notes. I want to cover the definition of discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? Number two, the conditions of discipleship. Are there conditions? Number three, the invitation to discipleship, and number four, the task of discipleship, making disciples. Now, Luke 14, verse 25, it says this. It's a passage I've preached on years ago. I haven't preached on this passage in years. It's kind of exciting. It says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple." Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and, and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? If he, if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees him will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish it. 
Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider what he is, if he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against them with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off, and he will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple." Texas, I've asked you this many times. Can I ask you one more time? Can you get me a glass of water? I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Jesus says, this passage, by the way, is as politically incorrect as you can get. I can't think of a worse way to invite the masses than to say what Jesus just said here. Did you get what I just read? Was Jesus serious? Large crowds were coming after him. Donald Trump loves large crowds. Trudeau loves large crowds. That's what it's all about. The larger the crowd, the better. The greater the applause, the better. And Jesus does the unthinkable. He tells these large crowds things that are hard to hear. And he says, unless you hate your father, mother, son, or daughter, you can't be my disciple. Now, I want to get to that later on. First of all, what does disciple mean? The word is matate. It means pupil. It means apprentice. It means adherent. It means student. That's what disciple actually means. And I'll give you a brief history of, of the concept of discipleship 2,000 years ago. And many of you know this already. That back then there were teachers, there were rabbis, people that taught theology, philosophy, and different ways of life. The Greeks also had this in their culture. And um, what these rabbis and teachers did, thank you so much, appreciate that. What these rabbis and teachers did was um, they would sit around or walk around, pontificate and elaborate and instruct, and, uh, and people would come and somebody would say, I like the way that guy teaches. I like the way Methuselah teaches. I like his mannerisms. He's got more wisdom than the other rabbis. I'm going to hang out with him. And so people would come, guy, young guys maybe in their teens would come, and they would follow this Methuselah wherever he would go, and they would listen to all his words. They would read Write, read everything that he would write down on papyrus sleeves, and they would l read them, and they would study them, and they would memorize them. They would emulate the way he thinks, the way he teaches, and they would actually try teaching the way this guy teaches. They would become this person's disciple, and this discipleship process could go on for months, maybe even years, and eventually these young disciples would become teachers themselves and would become rabbis, and they would have their own following of disciples. Now, that's what happened back 2,000 years ago. And by the way, we still have that happening today. We still have people listening to every single word maybe Oprah Winfrey says or Eckhart Tolle or Richard Dawkins. It's called discipleship in a new way, but it's still happening in the Western culture. Make no, mistakes, make no mistake about it. Celebrities have all kinds of disciples. Jesus comes along, and he does the big reversal. Jesus, he actually goes and chooses his disciples. Now, I want to say one thing. We often think of when I were to ask, if I were to ask you who were Jesus' disciples, you'd say, well, there were 12, and then you'd go and list all 12. The fact of the matter is, we'll find out later on, Jesus actually had far more than the 12, but those were his most intense disciples. And I want you to know that Jesus chose those 12 disciples. How did he choose them? And I want you to also know that this wasn't an instantaneous thing. Sometimes we get these stories, we sing these songs, and we maybe do the actions. They dropped all, and they followed Jesus, and we think it's quickly. They saw Jesus, and within five minutes, they were following Jesus. But if you read John 1, if you read Luke 5, if you read, is it Matthew 4, and I think Mark 1, if you read the stories of discipleship, you, found out, you find out that this is a process. In fact, in, in Luke 5, Jesus, he's going by the Lake of Galilee, or Gennesaret, or Tiberias, I think all the same lake, actually. And uh, he sees a couple boats kind of parked uh, at the edge of the water, and the, and the fishermen, they were fixing their nets. Back then, nets were, they had weights on them to br uh, bring the net real low so they could catch the fish at the bottom of the lake. And these nets would sometimes break because of these weights, and they'd be, the weights would be little rocks, and they'd have holes drilled in them, and they'd hang the rocks at the bottom of the net, and they're bringing the net way down. And so these guys were constantly, in fact, as much time was spent fixing nets as actually fishing. 
That's dedication. Anyhow, by the way, but there is a powerful application in that, but we won't even go there. And Jesus comes along, and, the, and the, the boats are there, and they're washing their nets and probably fixing their nets. And Jesus, he sees a boat, and he needs a podium because the crowds are probably crushing him against the lake. I don't know. And he sees a boat, and then we find out later on that that... Uh, that uh, Misty River boat over there, that's Peter's boat. It's Simon's boat. And Peter, and, and uh, Jesus steps in there and he starts teaching. And I can tell you this, that while these guys are washing their nets, they're listening. What's Jesus saying? That's pretty good. They've heard Jesus before, I can tell you this. In fact, in John 1, you actually have the brother of Peter by the name of Andrew. He hears John the Baptist say, watch Jesus walk by, and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Andrew immediately looks at Jesus, and he follows Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, what do you want? And he says, Jesus, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. And so in other words, we find already that there's a relationship that happens. And these guys, they listen. They've heard Jesus preach. They've heard John the Baptist talk about Jesus. And there's a relationship that happens. And so when Jesus, after he is done giving his homily or his message on the, in that boat, he tells Peter, and Pete's just had a real bad night of fishing. He didn't get his quota. In fact, he didn't get a single fish in the net, I'm speculating. He says, hey, Pete. And Pete's probably washing his net, and he's like, this famous guy's talking to me. And he says, Peter, try fishing again. So Peter grabs his net, and he says, well, if you want me to fish, I'll fish again. I'm, I'm filling in a little bit on this dialogue. And you guys know what happens. They drop the net, and the, the net is so filled with fish, almost instantaneously the net starts breaking. I remember as a kid always being sad that that net broke, always thinking, boy, they lost all those fish, and always being so troubled that that net had broken. I'm not sure. I might be off there theologically, but I do know after the net was packed, filled with fish, Peter comes back to shore, looks at Jesus, and he says this. He says, get away from me. I'm an unclean man. Peter recognized that there's something powerful about this rabbi there's something drawing about this this rabbi there's something intriguing about this rabbi but there's something scary about this rabbi because when he tells me to fish the net is so filled that i can't even lift the net this guy is wow and then jesus looks at peter and he says from now on you won't fish for fish anymore from now on you're going to be catching men and then we read in other translations he says in other chapters he says peter follow me follow me and he tells Andrew, he tells James and John, the sons of Zebedee, follow me. And Zebedee was left with his hired hands, no more sons to help him fish. Jesus says, follow me. That, by the way, is if I say nothing else and if I run out of time, following Jesus to this day is, I'll use a big word here to make me look smart, is the raison debt for our existence. We are not told to make Converts, we are told to make followers of Jesus Christ. That is the essence of the gospel. That's the essence of apostolic Christianity, to follow Jesus. And does my life portray as one following Jesus? And so back to this Luke 14 passage that I just read. Jesus has already welcomed people to follow him. And then... And I'm thinking, Jesus, you've got the multitudes, and they're wanting to follow. You're the most famous rabbi in all of Galilee, in all of Nazareth, in the, in the whole area. Jesus, Jesus, don't say these things. Don't say these things. They're hurting your reputation. You're going to scare off all the followers, and you'll be left all alone. And by the way, at the cross, he was finally all alone. The disciples choosing him... By the way, Jesus has chosen you. Did you know that? That's beautiful. But one of the reasons, in fact, I'll give you two reasons. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He was one rabbi that loved his disciples and he wanted them to follow him. But number two, he chose his disciples because he was saying, I am Lord and this discipleship process is in my terms, on my terms, I choose you. And even the very, cho the very choosing is on my terms. I'm Lord, don't ever forget that. And so here again, he gets hard. He says, unless you hate your father, mother, son, or daughter, you can't be my disciple. And anyone who doesn't carry the cross can't be my disciple. Very simply, I'll say it, Jesus is not telling us to hate our family. He's not. He's simply not. 
In Matthew 10, he says something very similar. He says, don't think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to turn a son against his father, a daughter against her mother, a mother against her daughter, a dad against his own son. He says this. He says, anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me cannot be my disciple. Anyone who loves, anyone who loves her daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, what Jesus is saying, in light of your allegiance to me, in light of you following me, it will mean as if at times you are hating Johnny because you say, Johnny, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Dad, I can't do what you're asking me to do because I love Jesus first. Boy, we could go on with that. I just want to make that abundantly clear. When, when God asked Abraham in, is it in, in Genesis 11, is that Genesis 11? To go offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, he was in essence saying, do you hate me in light of your love and allegiance to me? That's what he's saying. And I, I think, you know, one song that comes to me, Jackson, you, say, you played a Keith Green song here before, right? Which, dust to dust. Keith Green, he's saying this. In light of this passage, I believe, he's saying this. He says, I pledge my wife to heaven for the gospel, though our love each passing day just seems to grow. As I told her when we wed, I'd surely rather be found dead than to love her more than the one who saved my soul. And he says, I pledge my son to heaven for the gospel, though he's kicked Beaten, ridiculed, and scorned, I will teach him to rejoice and lift a thankful, praising voice and to be like him who bore the nails and crown of thorns. That, by the way, is a powerful theological explanation of what Jesus is saying right here, right now. Corey, I'll love you, but I will never love you more than I'll love Jesus. Never. That is true love. That is, by the way, the most secure position any woman can be in is if her husband loves Jesus more than he loves her. Now, discipleship. What does it mean? So the definition, I've just defined discipleship, the conditions of discipleship. There's four things I came up with with this passage right here. Number one, discipleship means leaving and letting go. That's what discipleship means. It means that we all have nets that we got to drop. And before it's all over, I'm going to tell you about the joy of dropping nets. If you've never encountered any joy of dropping a net, you've missed I'm not sure what percentage, but you've missed a big portion of the reality of discipleship. Jesus draws people unto a life of joy. But I want you to know that discipleship means leaving and letting go. It says they drop their nets and follow Jesus. Matthew, when, Peter, when jo Jesus strolled past Matthew in his despised booth of tax collecting and everybody hated the man, Jesus didn't hate the man, he loved the man. But he says, Matthew, come and follow me. Now, again, the movies make it look like he just bounces up. and No, I'm sure he had to do some paperwork. I'm sure he got his buddy, um, Johannes or whoever. I'm sure he got him to take over the booth. But he was determined to leave his life and follow Jesus. In other words, he was leaving his life of opulence. Tax collectors made good coin. They made good scratch. He was determined to leave that life and follow Jesus. And he wrote Matthew. And Matthew's also one that said that Jesus told him, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Maybe I'll get into that later on. Jesus called people to discipleship. He called them to letting, letting go and leaving things. The question is, what are we called to leave? And I, I, it does grieve my heart. I remember being at a concert a couple of years ago, and it was, you know, one of these old Christian rock bands, and I won't say the name. And at the, at the, at the end of the concert... We have, the, we have the altar call, and I'm not, or the invitation. I'm not against that, by the way. I believe there's a weakness in some of that. How this individual gave this altar call, and he, and he led people through the sinner's prayer, and at the end he says, no, that wasn't so bad, was it? Did he just inoculate them to the reality of discipleship? Or was he welcoming them, welcoming them to leaving and letting go on things that tear and things that could hurt unto greater joy, unto greater reality? Letting go means saying no to reputation. 
It means saying no. What, Dale's a... It means many things. Letting go means many things. It means letting go of my allegiance to what the world covets as the most important priority. Could be money, could be fame, it could be anything. It means letting go. And these guys had to let go. When they let go, they let go. They let go. In fact, we don't, we don't believe that they actually sold their nets because we find out in the last chapter of John that they actually went dragged their old nets out of the archives and they started fishing again for a night. And then Jesus came around again and they dropped him again. Some of us have to re-let go of another net. Ah, that net came back. It's, it's caught me again. It means leaving. It means letting go. Number two, discipleship means following. Now, years ago, we played a game called follow the leader, and so whatever the leader did, the other person would do. And I'm, I'm, I suspect kids are still playing that to this day. What Jesus is saying when he says, follow me, he's not just saying, if I should walk down this road, walk down this road. He's literally saying, do as I do. And so years ago, when everybody was wearing those bracelets, WWJD, Jesus that, in essence, was saying, I'm following Jesus. What would Jesus do? Jesus is actually speaking very practically. Follow me. And he says this. He says, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He says that in verse 27. He's literally saying two things. He's speaking prophetically. He's saying, I'm going to die a martyr's death. I will die by the hands of the Romans on a cross because the Jews can't kill me on a cross. He's literally saying, that's how I'm going to die. But number two, he's saying, if you follow me, you're going to die on that same cross, if not literally. And some of them died, did die on that same cross literally. Peter did. He died upside down on the same kind of a cross. But he says, you will also have to die figuratively speaking when you come after me. That means you have to die. David Wilkerson, he says it very grad graphically. He says, when God grad graduates a man, he graduates him as a dead man. When Jesus says, you follow me, it means pain. But he says, number three, another thing that Jesus says when he welcomes people to be his disciple is he says, accept the words I'm saying. Accept the words I'm saying. In other words, I'm going to teach, are you going to accept them? And some of the words, now what do I mean by this? In John 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples. And he's teaching about him being the bread that came down from heaven. He's teaching about him being the blood and the bread. And he's teaching about unless you eat from this blood and drink from this bread, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, he's saying, unless you fellowship with me, unless you hang out with me, unless you listen to what I have to say, you don't identify with me. You're actually not even a follower of me. Now, some of them were horrified by his graphic language in John 6, and then it actually says they started grumbling among themselves, and then they say this. They said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? That's what the disciples say in John 6. They don't say, this is hard teaching. Who can understand it? They say, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Later on, Jesus looks at his 12 disciples. In fact, it says most of his disciples at that point left him. And he looks at the 12 and he says, do you guys want to leave me too? They say, no. Who else has the words of truth? You are, the, you are the Christ. And when Jesus says, when Jesus tells people, you must accept my teaching, he knows it'll be hard. He knows it'll be hard. Let me give you an example. I just heard of a, a, a my niece was at another camp, not Eagle Lake, just recently, and, and there was a 12-year-old that was really interested in being a follower of Christ. And for an hour straight, she just fielded questions and, and, and asked my niece questions, 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 questions. And one of her last questions was this. If I follow Christ, does that mean I have to be against same-sex marriage? Now, what would you say? What did Jesus say about the sanctity of marriage? What did Jesus say about the Old Testament? Did he raise the bar or lower the bar from the Old Testament? What did he do? What did he say reflects ultimately the church? What was Jesus' view on marriage? And so when Jesus says, when you follow me, you will accept my teachings. My teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. My teachings on mercy. My teachings on grace. My teachings on on. On, on prayer, my teachings on fasting, my teachings on giving, my teachings on forgiving, my teachings on mercy, my teachings on not holding a grudge. These are my teachings. Will you accept them? Number four. 
and it's linked right to the acceptance, it says this. He says, Jesus repeatedly says, anyone who does not obey me cannot be my disciple. In fact, he says in John 14, he says, he who loves me will obey me, and my Father will come to him, and we will make our home with him. Jesus is literally saying, if you want to be my disciple, you need to obey me. Talking about camp, did you know that some of you old people remember a guy by the name of Elvis Presley? Did you know that Elvis Presley memorized 1,750 verses to go to camp for free? 350 verses a year for five years straight. Why am I saying this? If Elvis Presley had become a disciple, the very things that those verses that he was memorizing were telling him to. If Elvis Presley had decided to accept the teachings of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, if he had decided to follow Christ, if he had desired to emulate Christ, his career would not have gone where he had, it had gone, and he would be a different person, and we would be talking about him differently. Memorizing the words of Christ is not the same as accepting the words of Christ. It's not the same as obeying the words of Christ. It's not. It's not. And I want you to know that Jesus was adamant that his disciples catch this. John MacArthur, he says this, he says, he says, obedience is non-negotiable in the Gospels, and nor would any convert of Christ or any disciple of Christ ever want it to be negotiable. I love how he says it. We got to move on. There's so much I could say about that. The invitation to discipleship. I just want him to be very brief here. Jesus welcomes everybody. Everybody can be his disciple. You get that? Everybody. Short, fat, tall, rich, poor. Everybody. He says, if anyone would come after me, if anybody, anybody can be his disciple. I remember coming home from work just the other day and we saw these bikers go past us and they had the rockers and, the, and whatever and the patch had set and we were talking a bit about, we were talking to biker, biker lingo and how the Hell's Angels, for example, if you're black, you can't join them. Now, this new bike gang called uh, Iron Order, you can be almost anybody and join them, but there's still rules. Jesus, he says, if you want to follow me, I don't care who you are, anybody can follow me. And I love what he says in the Great Commission. He says, go into all the world making disciples of everyone. The invitation is open to everyone. It's open to everyone. And I want to say this right here now, and this is a lie that has crept into the Western church. And I'll graphically illust I'll illustrate this. Michael, Tal uh, Michael Wilkins, uh, uh, a theological prophet, Talbot Seminary, he often does this, apparently. He, when he speaks to crowds about discipleship, he'll say, how many of you are Christians? Raise your hand. And he says, invariably, 99.9% .9 raise their hand on the spot. And then he says, how many of you consider yourself to be devoted disciples of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. He says, invariably, a couple people raise their hand. He waits a little, he waits a little while, and then their hands go down. And I remember even years ago reading a theologian that, if I were to say his name, you guys would recognize him, certainly you that are 50 years old and older. And I remember reading on him, reading him on, on Luke 14, and he says this. He says, heaven is made up of two people, disciples and Christians. But he, he literally differentiated between the two. Jesus and the apostles don't give us that luxury. We're disciples or we're not. We're disciples and Christians or we're not Christians. Discipleship means following Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean perfection. We know the mercy that Jesus poured on Peter after Peter denied Christ. Jesus welcomed him right back. We know that. We know that Peter didn't only once, two, three times, he undermined the teachings of Christ. At one point, he literally becomes anti-Semitic. He wasn't perfect, but he was a disciple. He was a disciple. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. And I just wanted to delve into this one a little bit yet, and then we're going to simply read... Um, I just close with some comments that I want to make. And I want to say this, is that the task of discipleship given for us by Jesus in the, in the, in the Great Commission, we know the Great Commission probably off, off by heart. All authority in heaven and on earth is given me. That's what Jesus says. In other words, authority, exousia. All authority, that means rightful power. All authority has been given me. So in other words, I have the authority to tell you what to do. 
Not only that, the authority I have and the power I have, I now give to you. So he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Now go make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples at the regional high. Go make disciples at the Blumenor Junior High. Go make disciples at SCHS. Go make disciples if you're 13 years old or 33. Go make disciples on your football team. Go make disciples wherever you go. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's discipleship. Some of you young some of you young guys in, in, in junior high, if you even have a five-minute conversation with somebody telling them about the teachings of Jesus, and they might ask you one question, you have already started making a disciple. I remember years ago, I had a guy t- email me, maybe I'll give this little illustration, it caught me off guard. And I'm, I'm going to say this to lead me into my next point. He, he emailed me. He said, his last line to me was, Dale, I want to be like you. <laughs> now, he wanted me to mentor him. Part of me felt like saying, you don't know me. You don't want to be like me. But hang on just a second. Why not? If I love Jesus and I'm following Jesus, be it all imperfectly, why wouldn't he want to start out by being like me? Paul repeatedly says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's what Paul says. Folks, there is nothing proud or arrogant telling somebody, be like me. In fact, that just shows that you are relying on the very grace of God in you. You're loving Jesus more every year. You're loving Jesus. You're loving your wife more. You're loving your sons more. And you're telling your neighbor, be like me. Watch me. Watch how I treat my wife. Watch how I treat my sons. Yes, I mess up. But this is discipleship. And this is my point. Being a disciple, one of the most powerful realities of making disciples is being a disciple. People will watch you. They'll see what you're doing. And then when you have a chance, speak to them, teach them. This is one of the realities of of discipleship that I find is absolutely, absolutely exciting. Discipleship's for everybody. It's for everybody. Some of you are going to camp right now and you'll be counseling. You're making disciples. Some of you mums, you've got, you've got a, a kid on your knee almost. You're making a disciple right there. You've got your kids in the front bench. That's discipleship. Sunday school teachers, you're engaging in discipleship when you're teaching them about Peter, James, and John in the sailboat, and you're teaching them about the nets that they may have to leave one day. That's discipleship. When Vince Kaler tells us about being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, that's discipleship. That's the process. We can read all the books we want, but discipleship takes time. It takes commitment. It takes love. But it takes a powerful desire to be like Jesus. And I mess up. I'll tell you, me as a boss, as an employer, I mess up all the time. Just the other day, I was on the phone with somebody that that many people don't like in my trade, and my blood pressure was rising and rising. And pretty soon, the conversation was getting a little enthusiastic on the phone and we were talking to each other and eventually eventually I said you know what I'm getting a little tense here Mike his name was Michael I'm sorry but being disciple is more than that and so God convicted me Dale if you get a chance go talk to him the next morning I go into his office I says Michael I am sorry I I was the way with you I was on the phone yeah don't worry but no 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 don't worry no 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 Michael I'm sorry I don't want to be like that I want to be a man of peace that's discipleship when I get invited to another office and I'm told I'm offered them, I'll do your house for $19,000, and they tell me, well, we'll pay you $14,000 in $100 bills cash the day you're done. What does a disciple say? The disciple says, well, you know what? If there's no paper trail, a non-disciple, I won't report it, and $14,000 cash is worth more than $19,000 with the paper trail. Those of you who are accountants know that. Ronnie Brandt would agree with me on that one. That's not, rock, that's not rocket scientist. What does a disciple do? I report every single nickel I make. That's discipleship because it's honesty. It's living out the Sermon on the Mount with respect to honesty. That's discipleship. It's being like Christ. It's being like Christ. And that's our mandate. And some of us, Jeremy and Kara, they're off to the Mideast. God bless them. They're making disciples there. 
Some of us are going to stay in Blue North, but we are all engaged in making disciples, whether it's praying, whether it's a homeschool mom, whether it's a teacher at the Blue North. You can make disciples there, whether you're a nurse. And they say, well, you don't mention Jesus Christ. There's many ways you can be a disciple and a bold disciple. Will you be persecuted? Yes. Will some of us lose our jobs? Yes. But our glory is to be disciples. And I want to close with this thing. I'm leaving out a lot, trust me. I just want to, I want to close out with this reality. And that's this. Is that discipleship is ultimately for our joy. It's so me mautich moke. Being a disciple and making disciples. Jesus, who is the greatest discipler of all time, this is what scripture says about him. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus was motivated by joy. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Joy. He was motivated by joy. In, in uh, Luke, uh, which one is it? No, it's in, I don't even know which chapter. Forgive me. He sends out the 72. They're all disciples. And what happens when they come back to him? They come back with joy. A few verses later, it says, Jesus filled with joy. Our discipler is a man of joy. And if we're going to be like him, if we're going to emulate him, sooner or later, I'm going to have the currency and the current of joy flowing through my veins. The early apostles, when they were persecuted for Christ by the Sanhedrin in Acts, it literally says that they walked away rejoicing. They were rejoicing. It says in Hebrews, they joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. Now, some of you are thinking, Dale, that's like putting lipstick on a pig. You're telling me to be joyful, but I just don't feel joyful. I can act joyful, but it means nothing. I used to get so bugged when I'd hear preachers say, oh, be joyful. What do you mean? I'll tell you how to be joyful. Look at Christ. He's the great discipler. And he says this. If anyone, he says, if anyone, no, he says this. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Some of us are tired. Society is tired. Young people, they are exhausted of looking at pornography, ingesting Viagra just to keep up their sexual performance. They are exhausted. And Jesus tells that Viagra-induced 18-year-old who wants to perform over and over, he says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn for me, from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For that cross I'm telling you to bear, it's easy, and the burden is light. We've got a discipler who, would die, who died for us. We've got a discipler who'll do anything to make sure I make it to be with him forever in heaven. He's on my side. He's the most gracious, the most loving, the most father-hearted discipler of all time. You think about that. You pray about that when you're in your quiet time with God. You say, Jesus, give me a revelation of your glory, your mercy, your grace, because you're the rabbi I want to follow. I am your disciple, but this is also who you are. You're so tender-hearted. Sooner or later, I'll tell you, there's nothing but joy that's going to hit you when you realize that's who you are. I should shut it down. As you can tell, we could go on and on on this one. There's no end. Let's just pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, you said words that sting at times. But it's for our joy. Sometimes when my dad gave me a spank, it stung. But it was to make me more like Jesus. And being a disciple means I love my wife, Coralie, more. I love my son, Jackson, Weston, Texas, and Davis more. That's discipleship. That's growing in depth of discipleship. There is literally evidence of my salvation is worked through the depth of my following Jesus and becoming like Jesus. Does Corey say Dale is becoming more like Jesus every year? He's more soft more kind, more tender, more passionate, more fired up in the spirit, not in the flesh. So, Father God, I pray that this broad reality of discipleship, being your disciple, walking it out, and then having others see how we walk your path, and then getting them, encouraging them to be your disciple unto joy, unto happiness, unto freedom, unto liberation, is ultimate glory. That is our crown. That is the essence of salvation, is following you. The thief on the cross was a disciple for a few minutes, 
even turned around and witnessed to the other thief and says, who are you? That's discipleship. Father God, I pray that the reality of discipleship would grip us, that when you live in us, we are changed. We look at people differently. We act differently. That's the reality. And so, Father God, we want to follow the ultimate leader. We want to literally play that game, follow the leader in the Spirit all our lives. I pray this over the BEMC, that they would truly walk the road of discipleship for the rest of the existence of this church that you have used so powerfully in so many people. I say glory to your holy name. We love you, Jesus. Amen.